that's a shame. Okay, kia ora everybody. Kia ora tātou, uh, ko Angela McLeod Aho. I am with Rural Women New Zealand and I welcome you all to the Women in Leadership webinar. This is the third in our series, our Policy Summit series. This is a new thing that we have started because we haven't been able to meet through a lockdown to share with each other. So today we have with us uh, Mavis Mullins from Danivirk. We have Fiona Gower from the Port Waikato. We have um, Prof Susan Stellick from New York. And we have Amanda Ellis from Hawaii. So uh, we are international today and I welcome you all. Uh, first, we will uh, hear from uh, each, we will hear from each panellist five to seven minutes and then we'll have a Q&A, uh, question and answer session at the end of that. So welcome all and Fiona, um, I introduce you. Fiona is the President of Rural Women New Zealand and the floor is yours, or the webinar is yours, the Ethernet, it's yours. Okay. Um, kia ora, thank you Angela and thank you to all our panellists coming today. So kia ora tato. Uh, as Andrew said, I'm the National President for Rural Warm New Zealand, based up in the Mighty Waikastle. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. So when Angela asked me to speak about leadership, I thought about how we could do this. So I'm going to talk about that leadership is not about titles, it is about attitude. So anyone can be a leader. We all just do it in different ways. Um, women are all leaders in their businesses, in their workplaces, in their families and in their communities. We are all influencers and decision makers at many different levels. Just sometimes it doesn't get recognized, especially by ourselves. And leadership isn't just for those who are at the front, uh, leading in the way or in, in the top roles. We can be leaders at any time, leading by example, supporting and encouraging others, celebrating success and much more, things that we do every day without realizing that this is leadership. So Rural Women New Zealand has a long history of strong, successful women in leadership roles. Uh, so like taking 1925 when Rural Women New Zealand began as the WDFU, uh, these women started out making a difference to our women living in rural and remote New Zealand. This has led to so much change and difference being made to so many women, families and communities through, through strong leadership by all women at all levels of the organisation, from the grassroots and our branch members through provincials and regions to the national level and often at a global level for those who held roles within or supported the work within uh, organizations such as the Associated Country Women of the World and other international works at the likes of the United Nations. But growing up there was never the discussion around leadership skills that there is today. We now have the opportunity to learn more about leadership and what it looks like through formal training like the likes of the Kellogg Leaders Program or Agri Women's Development Trust on the job training and support in our employment, or in the community sector through the likes of Rural Women New Zealand, Dairy Women's Network, Young Farmers, Federated Farmers, School and Sports Clubs, just to name a few. But for me, it's a quiet overachiever with quite low self-confidence and quite a huge lack of self-belief. The leadership journey I have taken has been quite a challenge, some big hurdles to overcome. And I know there are others out there that have got similar stories. I'm now not quite such a quiet overachiever, but I still do have times of doubt. So my rural woman New Zealand journey began with my grandmothers and my mother. And as a child, I remember going along to many events and meetings. I, enjoy, I joined as a fairly new mum, needing social connection and brain stimulation after giving work, up work to have my children. And I'm so grateful to the support, encouragement and mentoring from all those amazing rural woman New Zealand aunties that I have out there who saw something in me and remain a very important part of my who I am today. So I thought I would share some lessons for those on the road to leadership. We need to look out for the speed bumps or impediments on our leadership journey. And other women can be our glass ceiling, such as women meaning really well, but saying such things as, oh, but you're too young, or what about your children? Or what experience have you got to hold this role? It's not great. To me, having children growing up being independent and seeing and experiencing what we do is far better for their development and understanding of the world out there and the importance of community. Not everyone will like us or the decisions we make, and that's okay. Being a people pleaser will get you nowhere. Be strong with your beliefs. You will get far more respect than if you're wishy-washy and keep changing your mind. Be prepared though to say, if you've got something wrong, Say so, if that's the case. 
there are the critics that we have to deal with who will try and derail you. I have been told that I didn't know what I was doing. I believe it was because they didn't understand what I was achieving and it made me even more determined to prove them wrong. And if we are doing a good job, then those who respect us, like us, and like what we're doing will way far outnumber those negative ones. So don't take it to heart. Surround yourself with positive, like-minded people to support and mentor you. Look for role models um, of good leadership behavior and learn from watching not quite so good in action. And I think we've seen that in the last little while. Do not be afraid to ask for help. People will do this gladly. I get huge joy out of watching the growth of women and what they can achieve. And I'm really happy to help out where I can. Learn to say no. As they say, less is more. Often on your journey, many offers have come our way. You don't have to take them all. Otherwise you struggle to do justice to them all. Be choosy and do a good job. Work out what you're good at and what you like. There's no point in doing something you may be good at, but that doesn't excite you. What is it that you're good at and you really enjoy doing? Is it hands-on management? Is it governance? Is it working with people or working behind the scenes? You make the choices. It's okay to have bad days. That is normal. And I defy anyone in a position of leadership to say they haven't had one. There are those days that we feel battered, bruised and run over by a stock truck. It isn't how it happens that matters. It's how you deal with it that shows what kind of person and leader you are. Follow in self-pity for a minute, then lick your wounds and get on with it. Times like this is when you need those mentors, confidence or friends to pick you up, dust you off and get you going on your path again. As I count down to the end of my term as national president, I'm incredibly grateful for the leadership roles I've been offered. I've had the opportunity to learn from some of the best. The opportunities this has given me have been amazing. The people I have met, the experiences I have had and the learning I've taken from it. My journey hasn't finished. It's just heading out on a different path. And that's all part of the adventure. Who knows what might be just around the corner for me or for you. So as you all head out on your own journeys, I wish you all well. Kia ora. Well, there you go. Very good. We're clapping in the office here. Well done. <laughs> oh, you're magic, Fiona. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. So with us today is Amanda Ellis. Now, Amanda is based in Hawaii, and she has a CV as long as your arm, um, but <laughs> was also former, um, yes, that's right, your two arms, albatross, um, <clears throat> uh, was the former... New Zealand Head of Mission in Geneva and did the work around getting New Zealand into the Security Council pretty much, um, but also has done a lot of work uh, through, it was one of the original, one of the founding members of the Women's Empowerment Principles Leadership Group. So I, the floor is yours, Amanda. Well, aloha mai kako from Hawaii and kia ora tato everybody. Inga mana, inga reo, inga rangitiratanga. It's a pleasure to be with everybody and see some wonderful friends here on the panel. Thank you so much, Angela, for the invitation. And thank you, Rural Women New Zealand, for the incredible leadership role that you all play in our wonderful country. Are we proud of Jacinda and are we proud of 47% women in cabinet or what? So the Interesting thing is that here we are in 2020 and not a single country has yet achieved full gender equality in practice. And there are still 1,669 discriminatory laws. How do I know that? Let me take you back to the beginning. So as a kid in Dunedin, I went to a girls' school and I was so disappointed when I turned up to science in the third form and we had the sewing teacher. And then I went to maths and we had the phys ed teacher. And I'm like, what? But girls apparently didn't need to know about science and math. So I used to steal the boys' notes after school and study so that I could still pass school cert, which shows you how old I am. Uh, many years later, I was very excited to be taken in as a diplomatic trainee 
to the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And one of my first roles was taking the notes at what was a, the precursor to an APEC meeting, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, way back in 1988. And then my boss came to me and he said, well, Amanda, I'm really sorry, but you can't come to the meeting. And I was like, but why? I, what do you mean? I'm taking the notes. And he said, well, you're a woman. And I'm like, yeah. And he said, well, we're having this meeting at the Wellington Club and of course, women aren't allowed. And I couldn't believe it. There we were in 1988 and I'd worked so hard to have a seat at the table and I wasn't even going to be led into the room, the meeting place where they were having the meeting. Long story short, I spent many sleepless nights figuring out what did I do? Should I re resign in, on principle? Should I pluck up courage and go and talk to the secretary of the foreign ministry and tell him off? Well, finally I befriended the uh, executive assistant of the secretary and I told her my story. And this was a really big lesson for me, always befriend the gatekeepers. And she said, well, this is very unorthodox, Ms. Alice. We've never had a diplomatic trainee come and think that they can have meet the secretary of the foreign ministry. And I explained to her what had happened. I said, well, I'm just going to tell him that I'm resigning and I'm going to tell him why. And she, she mused and she said, well, I suggest that you just tell him your story. And I have, am going to make an exception. First time in 42 years I've been here that I'm going to allow a diplomatic trainee in to see him. Uh, so just wait and see what he says. So Mr. Norrish looked at the ceiling and looked at his feet when I told him my story and then said, well, I'm not sure I really get your problem, Ms. Ellis. And then I said, because this is back in the 80s, Mavis, you'll remember, this was when the Māori Renaissance was really in full swing. And he said to me, so I said to him, well, if I were Māori, would I be excluded from the meeting on the basis of my ethnicity? And he coughed, oh, oh, oh. So it hit home. And he said to me, how about I write to the Wellington Club and let them know that in 1988, women are now entering the workforce. And uh, if they don't recognize that fact, they might lose much needed money. What do you think? And of course, I didn't think it was a great answer, but I said, yes, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Norrish. And as I left, he said, why don't you speak to some of the senior women and see what they think about this? And of course, such a hierarchical structure, I wouldn't have dared do that without his advice. So I did go and speak to the senior women. Long story short, we started the first women's network in the foreign ministry. And we were all delighted when the following year, we went to the newly gender equitable Wellington Club and had lunch together. So to pick up on Fiona's point, be prepared to speak up when something is wrong, even if you're terrified and you're just a diplomatic trainee. So fast forward, when I was a development manager looking after Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, I visited a women owned business that needed a $20 loan in Vietnam to help get a silk business off the ground. And I thought, wow, that's not much. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. I went back a year later and found this thriving micro business with heaps of women who were employed. And I thought, whoa, that's amazing. Women's economic empowerment. And they explained to me why women couldn't get access to money. And it was because land title certificates only had room for one name and it was the man's name. But it was a, it was a communist country, right? So there were, no, there were no real barriers, but there were these administrative barriers. So years later, when I finally started work as an economist at the World Bank and had the opportunity to then think about what was the first project that I wanted to do, we went back to Vietnam and we made sure that there was space for two, certificate, two names on the certificates. And that began a long journey into a project that is now called Women, Business and the Law. And it was my crazy idea to document all of the laws which impacted women's ability to be economically active around the world. Now, the amazing fact is, I thought that once we'd done that, of course, everyone would say, well, this is terrible. We need to change. But instead, what happened was uh, Saudi Arabia decided that I should be sacked because I was dealing with cultural and gender issues instead of economic issues. So they went in to see the president of the World Bank and said, there's this New Zealand woman who's really way out of line. And interestingly, this was another lesson for me in terms of male allyship. Bob Zalek, who was then the president of the World Bank said, 
we're doing a capital raising right now, Amanda. So I'm sorry, but I can't rock the boat. But what I can do is send you into Saudi Arabia to figure out just where the roadblocks are. And I can send you to Harvard to do a course called Leadership on the Line and develop a strategy for how we can move forward. So that was a great lesson for me. Sometimes you don't win by just kind of charging, but you take a step back. And now that little team that I used to run of four people has 20 people working for it. And they're actually looking at what New Zealand has just announced in terms of equal pay for work of equal value, for, sorry, for work of different but equal value. And we have, of course, our first Secretary of the Treasury, Carolee McLeish, who worked with me at the World Bank. And so she is on it. And it's very exciting just to see as we come across problems at a global level and recognize, in fact, that they are the problems that we're all still facing, even in an incredibly gender advanced country like New Zealand, where women first won the right to vote back in 1893. And the opportunity for us to work in solidarity on the global stage. So just to finish, we have a series of short videos that we've done, which are available to everybody. So Ange, if you want to put up the landing page, you can come. I work now for a wonderful philanthropist called Julianne Wrigley of the Chewing Gum fame. And so uh, she has a global futures laboratory at Arizona State, which I'd never heard of, but it is number one in the US for impact for the sustainable development goals and number one in innovation ahead of Stanford and MIT. And so we're really trying to save the world, save the planet. And we've started with SDG five to empower women and girls. So there are four videos which we've done in a big collaborative approach. And of course, uh, New Zealand Global Women is a partner. We should put Rural Women New Zealand on there too. And the idea is that these videos, three minutes, very short, to be shared with women around the world. They're being translated into a whole range of different languages. And there is also a link. If you click on, there's a map. I'm not sure if you can bring up the map, Ange, but you can click on the map and you can get a country summary, which the World Bank has done for us across 190 countries. And so you can compare Australia and New Zealand, you can compare Zimbabwe and Argentina and see where these 1,669 laws yet to be changed still are. But it's a nice little rubric because it tells you what the good reforms are, what remains to be done, and then very specifically what the law is. And the idea is that in the Human Rights Council, which I discovered when I went to, ambas I went to Geneva as ambassador, that every country, every three to five years, has its human rights legislation, including gender, examined publicly. And so this is an, a way for us to build a global coalition for change and to have women's groups around the world able to access this information and then to publicly advocate for the change that we have all committed to in 2015 around SDG 5. Fantastic. So here, Ange, if you want to click on New Zealand, you can show everybody the little summary that pops up. So you see the score, and then you can actually see the country summary, which is available now for every country, except three in the whole UN system, 190 countries. And that way you can see the score for New Zealand, parenthood, we still have some work to do there. And then you can scroll down and see the exact legislation that needs to change for us to get to 100 for New Zealand. So thank you all, everybody. I know I'm past my time. It's so fantastic to be with you all. And thank you, Ange, Fiona, New Zealand Rural Women, and uh, Susan and Mavis, wonderful, wonderful friends. Looking forward to hearing from you. Oh, thank you very much, Amanda. And what I've done, everybody, is I've popped the, yes, very good. <laughs> I've popped the two links that Amanda was talking about, as well as sharing. I've put them in the chat. So if anybody wants to go and have a look, in the chat they're there and also come um, start thinking about some questions that you can that we can pose to the panelists um, and, and can i just say one more thing and be very naughty <laughs> maybe this was our case study at the world bank yes. when i was there and we collaborated and colluded and plotted to make sure that we could showcase her as a rural woman in new zealand mm -hmm. with that she was doing with how i'm mullen shearing and what she was doing to make change in New Zealand 
around some of these parameters. So Mavis, that was, it all began with you way back in 2005 at the World Bank. So come a long way and thank you for the partnership. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. So yes, Mavis, um, the webinar floor is yours and uh, Mavis Mullins, for some of us probably needs no introduction, but Mavis is, as Amanda said with Highway um, Mullins sharing, but also does a lot of work uh, chairing and working on boards and Māori agribusiness across New Zealand. So, Mavis. Kei te mihi nui kia koutou. Kei te mihi nui kia koutou ngā mana. We seem to have lost Mavis. Uh, am I there? Hello. You are now. Yep. Oh, gosh, sorry. That's Internet right. connections, We're all... eh? Yeah. We're all broadband. But look, I'll... We're all broadband. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, ko wai au ko, rua hene te maunga, the rua hene's in my mountain, manua tu te awa, manua tu river, my river, rangi tāne atiau nui a paparangi, uh, are my people to hey Modi order, so therefore I breathe. And I'm Mavis Mullins, I'm really pleased to be here. Look, governance, leadership journeys, and you said it, Fiona, uh, they take you all over the place to the most unexpected places. And I've been really lucky that um, my journey's taken me from sharing sheds to um, science labs, science challenges, uh, telecommunications, treaty settlement. Um, you know, all from uh, what I like to say from the, the sharing sheds of the East Coast. So, you know, planning is great, uh, but it doesn't always take you exactly where you think you're going to land. And, you know, that's one of, I think, the beautiful mysteries of leadership uh, is that it, it kind of just meanders. Sometimes it is on go fast, sometimes go slow. But what I've really learned to do is embrace, embrace what, what comes. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not. But, you know, you embrace and you learn. So my governance and leadership journey has been great. Uh, and I love it. I enjoy it. And have been privileged enough to meet amazing people along the way. Um, but I was asked to talk a little bit about leadership in Te Ao Māori, which is leadership in the Māori world, but also te ao nui, or the greater world. And there's some, you know, some poignant kind of um, vignettes that come up for me. And the first thing is leadership is actually service, you know. And so when you serve, you end up leading. And with leadership then comes the opportunity for greater service and then greater leadership. You know, it, it's a potama or a stairway, but it does start and always end with service. Uh, from a Māori perspective, what we're going through now is a bit of a, um, a lead out uh, from our Māori women. And I like to think of it as it's wahine led, but it's about whānau empowerment. So women are leading out, but it's not for um, self-service. It's around the empowerment of families and how we lift our families to be what they need to be. The other thing it's uh, for Māori is that our, our kaupapa, our decisions are long. We play the long game. It's intergenerational. And a number of um, very successful Māori businesses now work with 100-year plans. And these aren't just WAF. <laughs> these are real. And I guess as farming people, we have opportunities for those long plans. Our forestry rotations are 30 years for a start. Um, QE2 or, or Ngā Whenua Rahui covenants, you know, these conservation covenants, they're 25 year. So, you know, making those long game decisions are not difficult for uh, the primary sector. One of the things I'm seeing a lot more of, though, is the alignment of intent and impact. Uh, you know, people go for impact, uh, and sometimes it doesn't always match the intent, and vice versa. 
But what I'm seeing a lot more is those things starting to align. And so you get a double hit, which is amazing. And I think that comes down to things like being values-based. When you're values-based, um, your intent and your impact often do uh, sit really closely. And then the last thing that's, that seems to be uh, a big deal now is that everyone and everything has a voice. And in this age of climate change and environmental stewardship, you know, we talk about Papatūānuku, our land. Our land has a voice. Our rivers have a voice. I've heard people talking about um, forestry harvest time and hearing the trees cry. You know, so it is tapping in to a deeper self when we start to realise that everything around us has a voice and we listen with all the senses, not just our ears. We listen with our hearts, with our minds, um, you know, with those spiritual beliefs of those are there, you know, everything. We use all our senses. But it's interesting, what I am seeing doesn't always kind of match up. So I'm seeing greater uncertainty and anxiety around the future. We've got global disruption led through fear. Um, and But what that also brings about, what it also highlights is that there's a lot of latent potential in our women, a lot of latent potential. But I guess what I also see, and this is disappointing, and Amanda, your numbers allude to it, is that the barriers for women are still there. And in some places they've even strengthened, where social inequity is still growing. And uh, I think you said it, Fiona, sometimes it's other women who are the glass ceilings. So, you know, there's greater expectations of women to keep the ladder down. And then, of course, Indigenous voices globally are getting louder. And the last thing is our young people aren't necessarily pleased with what they find um, themselves involved in. So, you know, I always like to leave us with a bit of a challenge. So I'm going, okay, and it's not a challenge because this is our job. What is our job here and now? And with all this stuff going on around, you know, we just need to breathe deeply and find that calm place because from that comes the opportunity to do great things. We need to find our tribe, you know, and they say, if you put your vibe out, you'll find your tribe. I love these poets who bring these things together, but it kind of works. You know, find the ones where there's like-minded. We need to step into our further future so that we know what to do now. And I've done some of this um, in mindfulness uh, courses, and it's just, you know, it is, it's quite a powerful thing to do. And then we need to reach out or lean in or be available or be present because Sometimes we get so busy that we actually forget to do those things. And then, of course, we need to really think about how we amplify our voices more. But as I think about leadership, this is a lady who, who does it for me. And um, although she's talking here about Aotearoa, this, this is a global message. And we see it all the time, but it's take care of our children, take care of what they hear, take care of what they see, take care of what they feel how the children grow, so will be the shape of Aotearoa, so will be the shape of the world. Now, as women, we've got the opportunity to, to make a mark in that place. So I guess my real message really is that, you know, we all can be the wayfinders. Uh, it just takes a little bit of courage and belief. And I'm really positive around the role of women in our world today. So tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Kia ora koutou katoa. Oh, kia ora, Mavis. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's, oh, yeah, just really good. Thanks, Mavis. Um, last but not least is a friend of ours. We all know, uh, all of us panellists anyway, apart from Fiona, you're going in for a treat here, I tell you. This is uh, Prof. Susan Stalick. Um, she's a professor in New York, uh, Stern, New York University Stern School of Business. And uh, I met her in Singapore some time ago and we've kept in touch. I've stayed at her place when I've gone to CSW uh, in New York. And um, Susan's um, prof's going to share some insights with us about um, that whole EQ and communication, uh, you know, keeping e each other, I guess, in, in our thoughts when we speak. So um, Prof Stalick, 
uh, the floor is yours. Thank, thanks, Ange. Um, I have to say before I get started, I, I can't talk about my life. Ange told me, no, you don't talk about your life. You have to be a professor tonight. So I'm going to lecture a little bit. I have a lot of data on slides that I'll buzz through and I can give you the slides, but can I just say thank you? I'm sitting here in New York and this is how I feel tonight because of our election. Um, Ange has offered me an extra bed, bed in her house. I said, it's the only country right now, New Zealand, that will have an American. Uh, we've all gotten together over a bonfire one night and said, what country are we gonna move to? No, we don't wanna give up our country, but it is nerve wracking. So I feel being with you tonight is therapy and I feel the warmth of all of you here. So I'm going to share my screen and then put my professor hat on, if that's okay with everyone here. Okay, uh, let me find my slides. They should be here. Well, let me not show you the last slide first. Here we go. <laughs> Um, I've done a lot of studies over the last 20 years. I can tell you this, 20 years in finance, 15 years in consulting and 20 years in academics, don't ask me how old I am. So the last 20 years, what I've been trying to do to connect this whole idea of communication um, with trust has been overwhelming. And I'd like to share some of it with you. In the next six minutes, I'd like to demonstrate for all of you, the practice of communication strategy will definitely impact your effectiveness as a leader. Wait, I have to turn my my clock on so I don't get late or Angel yell at me. Um, what I loved, Mavis, was your closing slide speaks a lot to what I'm talking about. It's this EQ, uh, it's bringing the head and the heart together. And women sometimes are afraid to let that heart go first. And yet that's our winning ticket. So let's talk about the urgency in our environment today, calling for leaders to rebuild trust in our organization. So this is what it's all about. Just think from eight o'clock for my time in the last 27 minutes, how the communication of these amazing four women on this panel have already in their communication with you negotiated the meanings and interpretations that shape our lives. In fact, they've already shaped and changed your life just by listening to them, whatever your reaction is. So let's look at communication strategy, okay? People study this, it's deceptively simple. It's nothing more than understanding your audience, having a clear intent, developing a message and responding to the task. Deceptively simple, right? Yes, however, there's one big problem. Throughout everything Mavis has said, what Amanda is saying, what Fiona has said, we have trust eroding throughout the globe. And because of that, we need to focus on this idea of communicating, communicating as women, communicating in global powerful circles. So the evidence is overwhelming. In the next 10 slides, I'm gonna go through some of that evidence. I'm not gonna go in great detail because then I'd be here all night, but I want you to take a look at this evidence. Much of it comes from the Edelman Trust Barometer. For the last 20 years, it's the world's largest PR firm. They've been managing trust in 28 markets, 34,000 respondents. And this is their latest report that just came out where they're saying trust is built on competence and ethics. And what you'll see later is that we don't get both in the same institution. If you look at their history, and it really happened in an American perspective after 9-11, that the fall of the celebrity CEO if you had a problem in a company, you got a famous person to run the company. And if you did something wrong, he, it was ra rarely a she, the she got booted out, but the he would just get up and say, I'm sorry, forgive me, and then move on. It didn't hold up. The two most important historical points in looking at this 20 years of erosion of trust was in 2005, it shifts from authorities to peers. And this happened because of social media and how we communicated that people trust their peers more than authorities. If you think about it, I wouldn't buy a refrigerator unless I called my friend first. I wouldn't spend any money. I wouldn't put power anywhere until I called my friend first. It's the friends and networks we build that are really going to, to manage the trust in the future. 
So by 2010, great, people start measuring it. We can't do anything without measuring. By 2013, we're measuring a crisis. By 2015, we say organizations can't be innovative unless we trust each other. We can't have these disruptive teams. By 2017, there's a rejection of established authority. It's everything that my fellow panelists are talking about. If that's erupting, we need to do something about it. So here are just a few statistics to kind of shock you out of your seat right now. If 60% of people rate a person like themselves as most credible, even the academics used to be number one, we're in number two right now. If we look at capitalism is under fire, capitalism is seriously under fire. There's a new language of social capitalism. Worry technology is out of control. Nobody understands technology, it's managing us. This is what's eroding the trust. Quality information, we have this orange haired man in our company that in our country that keeps talking about fake news. Where's the real fake news? It's coming directly from his mouth. This is not what we want to do to build trust in this, in this world today. We have news that's being reported as entertainment. And then we look at societal leaders are also not trusted, but we want them to trust. So what Edelman is saying is that we need institutions and leaders that know how to build trust with competence and ethics. And I also teach ethics. Um, it's a hard thing. Teaching ethics is really a conversation. So who is competent and ethical? If you look at the data closer, no institution is seen as both competent and ethical. Business is still perceived as competent. NGOs are seen as ethical, but institutions are seen as unfair. These next slides I'd like you to look at to see some of the data that has been put together, the demand for CEOs to lead, the idea that employees and people in power expect to be heard. It's the same thing I think that Mavis, you were talking about. They wanna see these partnerships forming and formed in a, in a trusting environment. But when we look at the average employee in an average institution, they want the relationship with their employer and they wanna be talked to. They want engagement and integrity. They want to understand and be listened to. So go through some of these statistics and I wanna leave you if I have 40 seconds with a homework assignment. You told me to be a professor, here's your homework. Start designing your own personal touch points, design your own trust barometer. It's a basic EQ. Are you a monitoring at all the effectiveness of your messaging? And you know where it starts? If people trust personal experience over data, they want you to talk to them. So start asking yourself the question of what goes into your script and how often do your stories actively nourish your significant and less significant others? And here are my two homework assignments for you. Number one, I, I love charts and graphs. Amanda, I love your charts and graphs. I love all the data you do. Just, uh, if I had a handout, I'd give you a handout. Take a piece of paper, list the names of all the people that are close to you. Start with your inner circle. Evaluate how their resource energy level is right now. Is it full, is it empty? And then ask yourself, how am I going to engage them and come up with a strategy for how you're going to replenish their resources? The one thing I learned a long time ago, just because a person's in power, it doesn't hurt to knock on their door and say, how's it going? So here's the last, last piece I have for you. If you're going to be effective in building your networks, you've got to learn to open up and become transparent. So please, Think about this for a minute. If you were to draw a window and in those four panes, the upper left is your open stage, what other people see, what you see and how you operate. And you look to that right window and it's what others see and you don't see. And you look to that left pane and it's the part that you hold quiet. And you look to the right pane 
that part that you don't see and others don't see. And you pay a shrink thousands of dollars to figure out, should I look at it or shouldn't I look at it? If you're going to operate in this environment today, you've got to become transparent. You've got to open this stage. And if you open this stage, what's gonna happen is your stage becomes larger. And when it becomes larger, we all are affected by that transparency. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me here. I went eight minutes and 42 seconds. I apologize, but I did thank you for, for giving me a little therapy here. 245 <laughs> electoral votes. We got to get 25 more and get him out. <laughs> thank you. Why is no one speaking about voter suppression is what I want to know. Ah. I am. <laughs> can you just um, unshare for a minute, Susan, and then I can um, see the question, any questions. Is it? Okay, so um, yeah, I don't see any questions yet, but yeah, that's a good question. So what is the, what is the answer? Voter suppression. What's the answer to voter suppression? Oh, is there? Yeah. Ah, Amanda has a question. Good one. Has Donald Trump been so successful because of radical transparency? No, I would say radical transparent lies. And when people are listening to social media today and they're not oh. doing their homework and where news channels have become entertainment, um, that's the problem. The second problem I can tell you statistically when they are analyzing the votes right now, we've allowed the deterioration of our public education system. So the people that are voting for him in the Midwest, many of them um, are coming from an uneducated background. We had a 60% dropout rate in our high school system years ago in public school. You can't survive as a, a, a community. Um, Amanda, I know you can speak to this when you have those kind of stats. Mm. Mm. It's certainly interesting. I think that there'll be, I mean, if, if nothing else, it'll, it gives a fair bit of um, feed, I guess, to some academics around the world to uh, analyze what's gone wrong or what's gone right or you know how things have have worked in the past four years I think from a comms point of view you know I find it really interesting how Mr Trump or President Trump speaks to people and how people I don't know I just I, I get concerned I guess for these there's leaders around the world he's not the only one right that in a, in a he there are you know there are many women who are good and there, there are a few who aren't so good but it, it's that leadership role model that bothers me it's the children that see that and think that it's okay to say that locker room talk is fair <laughs> um but uh, anyway we've got uh, we've got some more questions though how can we challenge recruitment if recruitment, um, you know, is if the panels, the recruitment panels are predominantly men. Anyone got a like to go? Yeah, yeah I, I would. Go to a different oh, person. Go ahead, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's very interesting that targets and quotas and rules are now becoming much more commonplace. And for example, Goldman Sachs has said they are not going to do any investing in, in you know, and they're hardly Lily White, but any investing in companies that don't have women on boards and women in senior management roles. And so that forces a change, not only through their organization, but through the organizations that they work with. And I think now people are beginning to recognize that you know, it's another 267 years to economic equality if we keep going along at the snail's pace. So people are starting to look at examples like Norway, where back in 2008, they said, okay, 40% of women on public sector boards. And then they looked a few years later when everyone said, oh, that's impossible, that in fact, the, there was a real diversity dividend and a great return on investment. And so I think giving that business case, I'm sorry, I'm boring old economists with numbers, but often actually explaining 
that you can't have an all male recruitment panel and expect that they're going to do things differently. You need to set rules so that you have diversity on your recruitment panel and you have diversity in terms of who is being interviewed and that there are targets. I think Westpac in New Zealand was the first company in Australasia to have 50% women on senior management. And it, it was about three years ago. And the question I asked was, well, how did you do that? We made it a KPI. So it's really important. We know that diversity pays off. And so therefore it's gotta be a KPI so that guys understand that this is an imperative for business. Sorry, mm -hmm. I got a bit. If I, if I can just say one thing, America made a big mess of it. When we wanted more diversity, we created affirmative action planning and our KPIs were just way too um, strict and not creative enough. Today at, at um, NYU at the Stern School, we're trying to become more diverse to reflect our students. So where are we going to recruiting? We're opening it up. You go to your students. Hey, introduce us to your circles. You, you keep, don't keep going to the same well. You don't do it just because it's always been done that way. And I think that's the hard part that you have to keep challenging. The only thing that I, I probably think I can add to that, great to hear the commentary. Um, you know, it it is, there is a shift that, but it's too slow, Amanda, you, you keep saying that. Um, but that's what keeps getting held up as the, the stand, you know, the standard. Um, but what, what I've started to see, and again, um, not that, I don't bank with Westpac actually, so just put that on the line. But, but you know, they've been so active in this whole issue around social procurement, and it is making a difference. Um, in Auckland, Ngati Fatua, you know, it's it's making a difference. So if it can make a difference, you know, and, and I don't think it meant to go too big too soon, but we're starting to see those who are watching, those of us watching, are starting to see some real. Um, some real movement, real movement. And so, you know, uh, things are happening, never fast enough, uh, never cool enough, really. But, you know, all I know is that there is, there is movement, there is shift, never fast enough, but there is, yeah. So can I, I just add a little bit to that? I think it's about looking at um, supporting a woman to, to, to the recruitment process giving them those skills. So because often, you know, when it's a male dominated industry or business, often the skills that a woman have may not be, um, they feel as though they haven't got the right skills for the job. So it's actually encouraging them and educating them to say, look, you have, you know, that, that statistic, where is it about, you know, if men have only know 50% of the job, they will apply for the job. Women need to know at least 90 before they'll apply for it. And I think that's part of the confidence that we need to change in our woman so yes, you can. You are the best person for the job. You need to sell what you do a lot better. And I think it's because I guess in our I talk about quite often in the language you talk about being just. Oh, this is what I do. This is just who I am. And we need to change that language and actually sell ourselves a lot better at what we do because actually we are the better people, the best people for the job. And often it's just getting that language correct at the interviews and through the whole recruiting process. So we need to encourage that with the diversity on the recruitment panels so that um, that diversity can actually support whoever's applying for the for the roles to actually be heard properly. Yeah, just one last thing, I'll jump in once more, is that um, what what I've seen with, you know, what the, the, the shifting that I've seen through AgriWomen's, in fact, has been significant. You know, I mean, Fiona, look at you, you're amazing. And you are leading a significant organization as a lot of your cohort, your alumni of that every woman. And that is about almost a hand-holding, tailored development plan uh, that, that, you know, where they're coached and mentored all the way through for a whole year. And yes, it's intensive and potent, possibly costly, but the outcomes have been significant. So, you know, we do have some models there. It's how we scale them. So sorry, Susan, I butted in on you. I just want to challenge something too and wonder what you think. Um, how, how much of the of the issue that women are facing as Fiona shared, how much of that issue around just or 
90 we 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 won't apply for a role if there's if we don't we we will apply if we do 90 percent and men are 60. how much of that are gender norms in the workplace and how do we change that and how do we when we're outsourcing recruitment uh you know how do we change that subconscious or unconscious bias which really is sexism i guess but um you know, how do we, how do we change that? Because how much of that women expecting that is a norm that's been drummed into them and how much do we change that? And will that change women feeling that way or needing to do that? Well, I'd like to follow on what Mavis has said um, and certainly the Korero around what Agri Women's Development Trust is doing and things like that. It's actually making these women realise that you don't need to have that, that actually we're going that's just a fallacy for us you know we're going to have a go and I think it's giving these women the the courage to go actually we can do this we don't need to have to worry about that and I think um we're getting to the stage we we are so much better at that now by saying that's it that's not wives tale we're going to forget about that we're going to do our own thing and create our own pathways and do our own thing without having that stereotyping behind us because I think we've heard it for long enough and go, we just don't want to believe it anymore. We want to make our own way. So I don't know what anyone else thinks, but I think the new generation of women are for, trying to put, uh, are forgetting about that and just doing what they do best. I agree. If, if I can um, just chime in here, even in an academic setting, it's, it's pretty ugly. <laughs> In, in terms of the, the gender difficulty. But I talked to my students the other day and said, you don't realize the power of your own voice. Um, only five years ago, students set up a group called Pride Corps. And at the university, being openly gay was not an easy thing for a man or a woman. But because the students set up a group I started seeing professors, students linking arms, but it was the students that had the courage. So a lot of times that change in voice is coming bottom up and we need to really listen to that and let them lead. These young people need to be given more responsibility at an earlier age. They need to make those mistakes so that they're ready to move into powerful positions. Um, I see that as one of the hardest transitions going on in society right now, particularly what I saw in corporate, when women did get a little bit of power, they didn't want to share it. Yeah, yeah. They didn't, when I talked to guys, they would always say, when I get my first promotion, I always look at my next job and who's going to replace me. And within the corporate world, I don't see enough of that going on. And mm -hmm. that's something we can all own. Yeah, good point, great point. Amanda, nice. And I do agree the younger generation, what we're seeing in the, especially in the rural sector, and probably Mavis, you can, will agree with me that um, there is such a change in attitudes when I first started in the industry um, quite a few years ago. It was very much very hard for a woman to get in any role. I remember trying to apply for a job and being told, you know, but you're a girl, you know, what do you want this job for? And even though I had the skills and the ability to do it, it was still that attitude. And I think that's changing a lot. And we're actually, you know, the our employers are changing because they're actually seeing that women are very capable of doing it and the training that our women are getting through the universities, through the courses like Agri Women's Development Trust, through the young farmers, through rural museums, through anything that they're doing like that to encourage them to say, you are good enough, is changing that language for us. And we're certainly seeing that when the young woman coming through and if this is the future of um, industry business in, in New Zealand, it's really, really exciting to see what these women are bringing to the table and changing the way the whole process is working. So I'm really excited to see where we're going in the next few years. Yeah, no, I agree, Fiona. In fact, some of our young women coming through are, are terrifyingly amazing. You know, they have just really grabbed things by the throat and that, you know, uh, I, I sit back and I go, oh, gee, that's, you know, there's energy that um, I don't remember having myself. I was probably the one in the corner, uh, but you know, there's a, a level of a of there's a level of confidence in in some of our younger women, but there's still there's still and this is my own granddaughter. She's at Vic University and she was doing something and she goes, oh, I don't feel like I can do that. I just about wanted to 
take her out the back and give her a slap because how can that happen? You know, my own granddaughter still, so there's this confidence thing. And I just wonder whether it's an age, you know, hormonal, whatever it is. Um, and maybe it's just something we have to pass through, you know, maybe we just have to know what that is before we can know what the other bit is. Uh, and so it is about the, the, you know, the positive affirmations and all that kind of thing to them as well. But I'll tell you something, I, I, and I've said it a couple of times, I love seeing how women have taken their place. Um, mm. But there is a but. I fear for our young men who feel hugely displaced. And I'm talking about our sons and our nephews, uh, possibly our fathers and our husbands. And so as this journey moves forward, you know, we, we need to be mindful still that our men have to have a place. And, uh, you know, I, I look at all of Amanda's stats and I go, oh, God. But then I, you know, I go back to some of my nephews and my, my grandsons and, uh, you know, they're having, to, they're having to fight it out with their very stroppy sisters, <laughs> uh, which is great for them. But I do worry. There's a little but there that sits with me still. Yeah. And I don't worry. It's our time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they I learn. Agree. <laughs> I see the I see the young men and I see when the women tell them that's wrong, that's bad. I don't I'm very proud of them. And yes. then you work, you have a conversation, you work through it. So mm. they'll figure it out. <laughs> Just to yeah. come in on that, I do think it's about the inclusivity and the working through it and figuring out how we encourage that. And part of the problem that I worry about sitting here in Hawaii, which was two thirds Biden, by the way, two thirds <laughs> in the right direction. I think we're the most blue state in the US, but we're also the state that is going through a Hawaiian Renaissance, maybe 20 years behind uh, Aotearoa. And it is just so wonderful to see the value of aloha here being taken on by everybody and this, uh, the Queen Lily Okalani, who was the one who was overthrown and locked up by the US businessman who wanted subsidies for their sugar, oh. had such an incredible attitude towards peace and tolerance. And she's written some very interesting pieces about this, which I think are relevant. She talked about being, it's the blade of a peely grass. Do you stand up for your rights or do you try to be the peacemaker and potentially get walked on. And I think that's one of the things that we as women really have to juggle with. How do we make our way in the world? And I love the notion of you know, this point that Susan made about you figure it out, but, but to do that, you have to come to the table. And that's where mm. I flip diversity and inclusion and make it inclusion and diversity as our friend Michelle from PWC says. So it's inclusion first. And then you figure out within that what diversity looks like and how everyone can have a place at the table. And I'm just so thrilled to be seeing the ecosystems emerging here in Hawaii that are truly inclusive and everyone is wanting to learn from and embrace indigenous wisdom from the Polynesian Voyaging Society, regenerative agriculture, stewardship of marine resources, and the whole notion of kaitiakitanga, which doesn't exist in Hawaiian, but, but there's that talk around it and the points that we all need to be cognizant of, if we're gonna be able to stay living on a planet with eight and a half years of carbon budget left people, you know, we're really, yeah. we're really in the buffer zone of the planet's reserves right now. And we have so much to learn from indigenous wisdom and, and from dialogue. So I love this notion of coming together and being able to, as you say, Susan, talk it out. So that was an incoherent rambling, but I hope you got some of what I was gonna say. <laughs> Oh, it's really good. So the, so the thing around that is, given, given some of the statistics that you've shown us, Amanda and, and, and Susan, and so we've got statistics that aren't looking that good for gender equality. How do we include the men and bring them along for that ride? How do we do that? I mean, I know it's a $64 million question okay. and it's 3 o'clock p.m. and you've got other things to do, but surely... I'll just give one quick. very quick answer in terms of, so I think back to my foreign ministry experience 
And it was actually providing a relevant analogy that he understood. So he understood racism because there was an issue of Maori Renaissance on the table that mm-hmm. leaders had put in everybody's face. And so he suddenly got that that was not right. Gender equality hadn't crossed his radar, but when the analogy was made between the two, he's like, oh yeah, I wouldn't stop somebody coming to take the notes if they were Maori, but I'd stop them if they were a woman. Oh, maybe that's not okay. So I think Mm. that analogy is one dimension. Because I'm a boring old economist, I think targets and numbers make a difference. And somebody said that in the chat Mm. brilliantly, like if if you actually, oh, Susan, if you publish the stats, then you can embarrass people because they've got to be measured against that. I know that's perhaps a, you know, a little bit basic and it's the first step, but by that, that radical transparency of data, maybe we can actually show, hey, it's not okay that we're in 2020 and not a single country has yet achieved full gender equality. And by the way, only eight have fully legislated for it and they're all in mm-hmm. Europe except for Canada. And come on, New Zealand, we can get on board by with our little map. We know we, we yeah. need to change. So I think this is... Part of it is that radical data transparency. And I'm so sorry, I have to hop back to my Pacific women's thing in a couple of minutes. So just to say, uh, mahalo nui loa, congratulations. Huge, uh, thank you for being here and being part of such a vibrant conversation. Thanks so much, Amanda. Take care. So um, Susan can Mavis. Add, yeah, can I add something to, to yeah. what Amanda was saying about this? Um, if you, if you took my 12 hour course and and I gave you one slide about learning to do, to do your own story, we need to change the language. Mm. If you walk Mm. into the room with the jargon, that's going to turn them off. If you want an inclusive conversation and you start talking gender equality, they've already have a mindset. I don't want to listen to you. But if we learn to tell the story within our own personal experience, credibility and authenticity and use our own words in plain, plain language that people can understand, it's a lot easier to engage in the conversation mm-hmm. rather than, than buying into all this jargon. Mm-hmm. Good totally point. agree, Susan. Mm. Totally agree. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, we are near the end of our time. Is there anything else, um, Fiona, Mavis, or Susan, you'd like to add? I know. <laughs> Tears too. Oh. Oh. Um, no, I'd just like to thank Angela for pulling this together and um, thank all our panelists for coming on today. It's, I mean, for me, it's always an absolute privilege to be almost sitting beside, although it's virtually sitting next to you, Mavis, um, but absolutely, it's always a real pleasure and a privilege to be working with you. You've always been a great role model for a rural woman out there and what you do. So thank you. Um, thank you, Susan, for coming in from New York, um, where we're thinking about everybody at the moment. But it's a great opportunity to show that leadership um, in all parts of the world, you know, we, we can do we can do this. We just, um, the first step, you know, it's taking that first step on the leadership journey and realizing what you're doing. is I think probably the most important thing and getting the confidence you go, having those people around you to support you through that is really, really important, whatever we do. So, um, and all of us are more than happy to support and mentor and help our, our woman or whoever in, onto their leadership journey and get them on the pathway, whatever that may look like. So, Papai Kia ora, thank you very much for having us today. Thanks, Angela. Thank you.